Good morning, and as, uh, as Andrea said, uh, we're the last panel between you and lunch, so we're going to try to do this as quickly as we can. The previous panel was a perfect segue into uh, this uh, great discussion we're going to have on smart buildings and microgrids. Let's see if we can move this forward. In any case, uh, while we get the slides set up, and I'm going to go through them very fast, uh, but they're there, they're going to be posted, we post on the CABA website, Andreas is going to be sharing it, hopefully it'll be part of the white paper that's going to be done as well. Well, it's good, but it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, uh, as we continue on, uh, what we are going to try to do is share with you some of the uh, interesting aspects of both intelligent buildings and microgrids, which are becoming a more a part of this new world no. that we see. It's for a Ron Zimmer. <laughs> it's coming. Lunch is just, no. Anyway, um, so uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, we want to share with you is some of the uh, uh, trends that are taking place with microgrids, some examples of not just uh, microgrids and, and intelligent buildings, but also as we move forward uh, with the uh, transition of microgrids as part of campuses and uh, naval bases, et cetera. We're gonna start, uh, Andreas, I think that's the way I've got to go through my slide, just don't put them on there. In any case, I'm gonna uh, start by asking our panel to quickly introduce themselves and uh, the organization they're with and, uh, and touch on a bit of what they do as it relates to intelligent buildings and microgrids. Starting with you, Alper. Um, we're doing this microphone in your mouth, please. <laughs> yeah, within, uh, within today, my name is Alpert. It's adding the multicultural uh, misspelling of my name. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm with Uncle Labs. We are a startup company. Uh, we are trying to revolutionize the smart building space by uh, creating hardware agnostic DDC. And uh, we do analytics at the edge with uh, four competing methodologies. Okay, Jay. Jay Zellner, President and CEO of Edison Energy. So our key thing is that um, we think that energy is the largest unaddressed risk, unaddressed risk, that companies face today. Our companies, our customers, are primarily CNI customers, and that it can actually exceed foreign exchange risk. Uh, interest rate risk. The key thing is that, that that we help companies do is use that to their competitive advantage by quantifying what that risk is and then helping them to design the solution to mitigate that risk. So that's what we do. Microgrids and smart buildings are just one key element why things have changed so dramatically as we heard today. So uh, anyway, that's Great. it. Greg, Greg Carter. Hi, I'm Greg Carter, and uh, I lead the smart uh, IoT and software business for Acuity Brands. Acuity Brands is a lighting company, and uh, what we're doing is looking at all the different kinds of technology that's being uh, installed inside buildings today, initially for energy savings, and figuring out now as, as we're creating all these digital assets, how can we use that infrastructure for a whole lot of other benefits uh, to the building owner and the building op operator, as well as the tenants in those buildings. Perfect. Curity Brand's one of our CABA board members. So. Sunil? I'm uh, Sunil Chavaran. I'm the founder and CEO of Spiray. Uh, we've been building uh, microgrids or related DER management technologies for over a decade. Uh, what's been changing in the past uh, about three years or so for us is uh, we're working with the channel partners that are actually deploying these types of hybrid energy solutions all over the world. And uh, the big difference, uh, of course, is that now uh, you are trying to get to the point where you're no longer developing very complex uh, microgrids, one-offs uh, uh, that, that you have been seeing over many years, but you're shifting that to saying, how do you help the customer with uh, commercially viable projects that you can um, basically design, configure, and deploy in a matter of weeks as opposed to months or years. So that's where we are focused and we work with channel partners and do projects uh, uh, in North America, in the Caribbean, in Africa, increasingly so in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so um, a lot of those projects are uh, have been accelerating and uh, we're looking forward to doing many more. 
Great, we're going to hear more about that later. John? I'm John Schummel, uh, Program Coordinator for Civil Engineering Program at Texas State. I'm a uh, structural engineer, materials engineer, and I must have missed the box where I requested a translator because so far I have no idea what anybody has said this morning. Um, the dictionary of acronyms is coming later. I, I, I was going to write a bunch down and just spew acronyms that were civil engineering and everybody else could sit out there going, what is he talking about? Um, at, your, at your tables, I went around and, and, and gave everybody, if, and if you didn't get one and you want one, um, one of these little handouts. Uh, we're, we have built a civil engineering program that is unlike, uh, as the provost said, unlike basically any other program in the country. Uh, 250 ABET accredited programs, unlike ours, two like ours. If you want to know what the two are, I'll tell you offline. Um, but in addition to this, we are developing, as the provost also said, a research facility out here uh, at Star Park. And so I, I think we're going to get into that a little bit later, but that's so the academic side and the research side. Thank you so much. We're going to talk about that later. For those that aren't aware, how many are aware of CABA? Raise your hand. Continental Automated Buildings Association. So as an international industry association, as president and CEO, I work with a very distinguished board of directors, as you can see from uh, the companies up there. Uh, we do a great deal of research. We gather research. We have the world's largest research library, all focused on intelligent buildings and connected homes for all buildings worldwide, industrial and et cetera. So one of the things that, uh, when I say the largest library now, Andreas, I think you're getting close to, uh, to our library with the many books that he, he's writing here. But uh, in any case, uh, we are a knowledge center. We work with all the sectors. And I'm so delighted to hear uh, we have utilities like Southern California Edison, Hydro-Quebec on our board. I'm going to go through these slides very quickly, as I said. What is the definition of a microgrid? Well, there it is, and there's many definitions, just like intelligent buildings. But there's the definition for microgrids. And, uh, and as we heard from the previous panel, this is becoming more and more uh, in, in the mix of things that we're seeing in the utility side. So as a result, uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about that later, uh, the, the benefits as we move to more integration in buildings and buildings campuses and moving to artificial intelligence, there's a lot of great value that can be had. The definition of intelligent building, some people asked me even last night, what, how would you define that? We take this building here. If you have these lights put to sensors, being part of an energy management systems, you actually have intelligence in this hotel. Most hotels are actually somewhat intelligent. Are they all 100%? Absolutely not. In fact, the McDonald's building corporate headquarters, which JL worked on, is probably the most intelligent building in Chicago right now, or the Edge building in Amsterdam. So, uh, but most buildings are have some intelligence. The problem is, of course, we have many dumb buildings out there. All right, smart microgrids. There's uh, here's here's where we're going as we as we see the evolution of technology into variable generation. The island ability where you can actually move them into a segment where, where it's very difficult for the average utility to serve. And now with demand response and coming back to where we really truly move into artificial intelligence, that is going to be so valuable both for the end user and potentially for the utility. So where are we going? So according to the research done by GTM Research on uh, the U.S. microgrid tracker, we're moving if you look at from 2015, 1.65 gigawatts, but moving 2020, almost a fourfold increase, up to almost five gigawatts. So we're really growing quickly as we see uh, the progression in microgrids. What's the size? What's the dollar value? So here's a fun fact. Uh, based on research and markets, uh, this research just came past my desk literally a week ago, but in 2017, it was estimated that it's four point six, seven billion dollars in this world of microgrids. By 2026, it's moving almost to 19 billion. So is this a small market? No, it's a huge market. Compound annual growth rate of 16.7. And how do smart buildings fit in? What we're gonna see more and more is that the end users, again, whether it's university campuses, hospitals, uh, campuses like uh, Microsoft, uh, building says that uh, that are becoming intelligent, they will actually 
determined that there is a lot of value in putting a microgrid or smaller uh, uh, type of device on to, to make sure that they have all the, the uh, benefits that can come from that in terms of value, reliability, uh, redundancy, etc. And I'll give you an example. Two year, or a couple of years ago, I was at a Dallas conference, two days on microgrids. And what we found was that, uh, what was, was announced then was the Navy was going on, on uh, basically going off grid. So San Diego, I think, uh, was one of the first Navy sites to go fully off grid. They're actually 1.4, 140% uh, now of what they can, they actually could produce. So they could be an export of energy. And of course, uh, groups like SEMPRA, San Diego Gas and Electric, not too happy because that was their biggest customer. We have a ton of free research here, uh, so do, do take advantage of that. I'm gonna go back to the panel now. My first question, and um, I wanna just come back to the knowledge that, that's here in terms of what they see in their particular segment of, of intelligent buildings and microgrids. And actually, I think uh, I'll start with you, Greg. Uh, obviously, the wor world that you're working as in intelligent buildings is uh, incredible. Your company is very involved, and we hear this term digitization. So, is your group really helping the end user become going to that level of digitization? What What are you doing? Yeah, let me let me give you one example. Um, as I mentioned in my intro, you know, we're taking building systems. Uh, we started with lighting, but we've now uh, moved into building management systems. And initially, uh, continuing the trend that's been going on for 30 years or so about trying to drive energy efficiency. So, you know, we, we saw that, you know, you started with endpoints coming in, whether it's high efficiency HVAC or it's LED lighting, making your endpoints more efficient. And then you squeeze more energy efficiency out of connecting those systems up. Um, you know, Ron just mentioned the idea of putting in lighting control, which treats all of these endpoints as, an, as, a, as a thing in the Internet of Things, right? So now you can sense and control to, to improve energy efficiency as well as, as occupant experience. But we really see that as just the first step in the transition to an intelligent building. The next step is to say, all right, now I've got this, this digital network that's above us and all around us, and there's already some sensors in place. There's light level sensors and, te and temperature sensors that start to tell us a little bit about what's going on in the room. Can we now turn that into analytics and intelligence that is not just useful for making the building more efficient, but is useful for making the business that operates inside that building more, more effective. And so the first uh, example of a, of a digital transformation technology that we uh, embarked on was, was taking the data coming from occupancy sensors uh, with, a, with a lighting control system and looking at that data over time uh, according to different zones, sometimes the same zones that were set up for the lighting control uh, system, but sometimes you know completely different zones that were of interest to the business. If you had a uh, you know a, a work share area a bullpen, or if you had different conference rooms that you wanted to understand how people were using that space, uh, we were able to determine uh, what was the occupancy in these different zones and different spaces to be able to arm the uh, real estate professionals before they go and invest in more space or more conference rooms to be able to reconfigure space that they already had because they could determine where it was, was underutilized. The next example of that was to say, okay, well, I've got this dense grid overhead. Can I use that to, to more precisely understand not just where people are moving, but where movable assets are moving? So we've put some technology into the lights, uh, Bluetooth radios, first of all, as well as um, we, we're leveraging the, the digital drivers in the lights to actually encode each of the, the lights into a unique uh, identifier, which allows that the light itself to be a beacon. And we're able to triangulate. It, it turns the, the lights into basically a GPS satellite system, and we can give you very precise indoor location. So we've rolled this out heavily in the retail space initially. We've got about 400 million square feet covered uh, with this kind of an intelligent indoor location technology. And we're using that to arm the retailers with uh, everything from customer experience improvements by, by feeding that data into the mobile apps and helping customers to find products in the store, giving them basically a Google Maps type experience in the store. Um, tracking where employees are moving to be able to improve workflows and, and drive operational efficiency. Um, and then taking all the data that streams off of these systems for marketing analytics. You understand where people are spending time in the store, how your marketing displays are working. And this is just in retail. We've got tons of use cases in healthcare, in warehousing, in manufacturing uh, that can leverage this kind of location-based service that basically is coming for free. It's being paid for by the energy savings for, for, for driving efficiency 
but, but producing a whole bunch of value for the other parts of the business. And that's where you're hearing the term uh, lighting as a service. It's uh, So you take uh, companies like Siemens, our, our major sponsor, they uh, got out of the lighting business with Osram and they sold. Now they just bought Enlighted, so they're back in because Enlighted has some great lighting controls. It's the low-hanging fruit. Buildings that do not have lighting controls, I think the payback is uh, varies, of course, but it can be less than a year of payback ROI. So as we think of an intelligent building, Sunil, how does that flow now into, say, a microgrid? Because that is now another piece of the puzzle which can make it even more valuable. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, one of the, you know, uh, the issues around microgrids, if you will, is, uh, is a definitional issue. Right? Uh, we just saw one definition uh, up there. <clears throat> Since we've been building microgrids for a while, let me let me slightly modify yeah. that a little bit. No, I said there's many. <laughs> <laughs> there were many, that's right. So the power, the transformative power of microgrids really comes about because if you have some software or a piece of uh, magic glue that can actually tie together more than one thing, right there is the transformative power of, uh, of microgrids. When you scale this and you look at buildings and any node on the system that you're actually uh, working with, if you can bring that intelligence there, and regardless of the widget that's actually tied in, if you can actually optimize it for different purposes at different times for different parties, if that, uh, that intelligence can be brought to bear, that is what will transform how we just um, look at energy and what it means for end users. You know, looking at, um, uh, last night, our keynote speaker was talking about uh, putting the consumer at the front, prosumers. What does that really mean? It just means that uh, they are becoming empowered for the first time to decide whether they want to mm -hmm. stay on the grid or go off grid or optimize for themselves. So long as the choice is on their side, so long as the tools are available to them, the rest of the conversation about uh, uh, you know, the stability of the grid and uh, you know, all of the issues that come up on that, the regulations, all the things that we talk about, becomes um, you know, necessary, but uh, you know, it's following what end users can actually do. That's really the power of microgrids, and uh, essentially, by rethinking that part, you know, it has uh, significant uh, implications on what uh, what can happen in the industry. In our case, um, our customers are in the business of turning on these nodes at different places, and uh, when you look at it today, uh, we are given, and you know, some of our big channel partners give us five days to commission a site. Five days. You know, the stuff has to get uh, installed. We go in. And, and that five days get uh, cut into two days to get a commission and three days for contingency, right? And that's essentially what you have. Now imagine how that, uh, uh, that, that'll that transform how we think about microgrids itself. So going from a concept to the design, to the configuration, to the deployment, to operations, as that time scale comes down from years and months to literally days, and I think that pretty much speaks for itself as to the power that it'll actually bring to buildings and building owners. I like your definition, so could you write that out? We're going to put that in white paper. But it goes, uh, let's, uh, let's move to John, because there's another real-world example that's coming here to, to uh, university. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, academic program and then touch on the, yeah. on the research side. So, so on this graphic, again, you'll, you'll notice that uh, little, this is our infographic that we uh, uh, sort of describes our program. The center circle there is, is what everybody does in a civil engineering program, analyze and design infrastructure assets. Uh, we never called them that before. We called them buildings and bridges and things, and now, we've, you know, now, now they're assets. Um, but we are going to be educating our civil engineering students uh, in that outer circle. So the event detection, the data management, the analytics, and the, and the asset management in a, in a multidisciplinary uh, configuration of courses. So, uh, like we've said, very, very innovative kind of academic program. Um, just had an aha moment one day and and came up with this idea. Um, we're we're civil engineering program 19 out of in the state of Texas. So we needed to be different, mm -hmm. and this is and this was the way that we figured out that we could be different. Um, that this was an aha moment. The research side was really a development. It was really uh, a, an incubation of ideas. It, it, it took a while for us to get from the first thought to where we are today and what's gonna happen today. Uh, at lunchtime, if, if anybody wants to walk with me, we're gonna walk down to the other end of the building and stand outside and what we're gonna look at 
is just an open field. So you talk about a green field, it's a green field. <laughs> it really is. It's a blue sky, it's a green field, and I should have put out a, a, a blank slate or you know, a, a whiteboard or something out there as well. Um, it's all those things. And, and what we have evolved uh, in our conversations about the research side of things is to actually, as the, as the provost mentioned, build a smart neighborhood. Uh, so two buildings are, are in the works, uh, the multi-tenant building that Steve had mentioned and this other uh, facility called IRL, Infrastructure Research Lab. That's, if you look at it and you look on any other campus, you're going to go, oh, that's a large-scale structural testing facility. Yeah, it's going to look like that on the outside. But we're not going to do on the inside what everybody else is doing on the inside of theirs, just like we're not going to do in our academic program what everybody else is doing in their academic program. Our focus on the inside of that building is going to be smart infrastructures. Can we develop sensing devices? Can we develop new protocols for data transmission, data storage, and, and all of these other things? And, and so we evolved to that state. And then we evolved to, we should do this on the entire property. So the plan for that property out there, the 50, well, whatever, 40, 46 remaining acres, is for every building to be connected. Uh, uh, sensing devices, uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a data center, we'll have a, a, a um, uh, just a, a multi-purpose, multidisciplinary research living laboratory uh, that is going to be active from here on out until something changes that we should do something else with the property, which it, who knows when that would be. Um, we want all of you to be partners in this because you guys know what to do. Just as I said earlier, I need a translator. Okay? I understand what the vision for the property is. I don't know what should go out there and where it should be and those sorts of things. That's, that's the expertise that you guys will bring to the table. So over the, the summer, uh, Andreas, Steve Frazier, and I were a team. And, and the plan is for us to actually put together uh, a, a business plan for what should be out on this property. And we need your help to figure that out. We need your partnership uh, to decide what to do, how to do it, where to do it. Well, John, we, we've got some ideas, yeah. but but we need. I was going to say, John, you're going to be one of the most popular people yeah. right I, here because uh, I'll be happy. All to these do uh, that. people that would love to be in that project will be talking to you after. Yeah. If you give Sunil more than five days, he, he's in on this <laughs> one. So so we've got uh, research. You talked about research. We have research at Cabo. Uh, we do a lot of great research. We have a white paper that was done. I have to write it out. Make sure I. I Pronounce. We worked with the merge. We, we partnered with a lot of the associations that were put up on that first slide. It's called the role of hybrid ACDC building microgrids in creating a 21st century internet. They use the term and emerge alliance. So that's free. You come to our website and see that white paper and others. Now, Jay, Edison Energy, you've been involved. Share some of your good stories, maybe the horror stories. I don't know. There may may not be any horror stories, but but what are some of the challenges you see as as as, as we move into this world of microgrids? One of the key things that I think is the biggest challenge with microgrids that frightens me a little bit. Having developed, built, owned, and operated many many uh, combined heat and power plants for in end use uh, for end use customers. Um, there is a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of care that goes into the maintenance and the operation of these microgrids. And uh, we heard a lot of stories about how people say, look, I just want the power to be on when it's on, mm -hmm. and when I go to flip it on. Same thing with uh, the people who, uh, the price, it will make a difference if that microgrid doesn't come up when it's supposed to, or if it doesn't function the way it's supposed to. A lot of money so that's a key thing that I think that we take for granted in the current utility state that I think is just because it's just an expectation just the way you breathe as Charles said earlier just the way you breathe you're expected to be there and there is a big oh you know what moment when that doesn't happen so that's a key uh, concern that I have with with the micro good trends yeah, and it's uh, so true because one of the things, though, it's getting better, though, because they're, as we move to the what I call smart microgrids and why the military 
have been one of the first movers because they don't want to be when Katrina hit or that big storm in New Jersey and the, and the power was out for weeks and weeks. They, they want to be self-reliant and, and they're moving them. So the military, I think, is one of the first movers. Definitely, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things that, as I mentioned, Edison Energy is the non-regulated component of Edison International, so our customers are end-use commercial and industrial customers. They are very interested in the microgrid concept, uh, but at the same point, their understanding about the capital needs and where they should put that and where they should make those investments are one of the key things that I think it's just like with renewable energy. Mm. A lot of these companies are making long-term investments in renewable energy, and they really don't do it with a view as to how it impacts their future risk as it, as it relates to um, energy spend. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, and so we help them basically make those decisions. So we're going to pass the mic to Alper. And Alper, uh, for those that don't know, uh, has been so engaged for a number of years, many, many years, and they, not the 22 years I've been, because you're not that old. Nine, nine, anyway, so uh, 19 years. When did you start? Anyway, so uh, basically, uh, but in the intelligent building space, uh, he's uh, done some amazing uh, new technology and, and bringing it to the marketplace. But talk about the, how the intelligent buildings have progressed and, and, and even how that might fit with the microgrid world. Yeah. Um, building automation has progressed um, uh, within the early 2000s when NIST said um, uh, proprietary protocols are not um, valid anymore. And a, a company was born out of R Richmond, Virginia that basically combined all these different protocols together so the building owners wouldn't be milked by the controls companies. And um, now, uh, since 2000, we are in 2019 now, and the, the, cha the challenge has changed to data, and now we are going into a, a new era of creating uh, va value out of the data that comes into the buildings. Also on the hardware side, uh, we, have, uh, we, we have seen Raspberry Pis and Beagle Bones. We have a lot more processing power at the edge at the same time. And uh, we create, uh, there's also another uh, project called Project Haystack that creates semantic data model, uh, just like HTML does for our browsers. And uh, this basically enables us to create uh, value generation without doing uh, what, what controls in a system integrators call click to death to create value. Uh, it, and what it means is that uh, you create a point, you link it to a graphic, then you link it to an alarm, or you click, link it to a historian, and um, that is a lot of time-consuming process. And uh, that part is changing, and um, once we have more power at the edge and it's semantically data modeled, um, the value generation and talking to the grid uh, microgrids will be much easier and you will be able to turn things on or off based on the amount of microgrids available for you. And uh, Alper went to Haystack, Project Haystack just had their event last week in San Diego and uh, we had uh, Greg Walker, our research director there, and, uh, and I, I'm so delighted. Our board of directors has taken a very strong position to push for open standards interoperability. That old saying, are we there yet? No, but we're getting there and, and do the work of those great yeah. organizations, so that's great. We created an a open source project called Project Sandstar, and that is basically, uh, the current model is that uh, hardware is built by company A and only can be programmed by that company, and Project Sandstar is open source. It creates, for the first time in the world, um, hardware agnostic direct digital controls. So you can put the code in between any hardware that you would like. Okay. Now, I, Andreas said, get a bunch of questions and put them on a little. I've got lots of questions. I, when is lunch? Anyway, uh, but I'm going to allow the audience because I, there's so many great questions. I'm sure going to come out. So let's let's bring the audience in. So, so Ron, my name is Steve Parnassus. I'll be kind of on the panel later. Yes. So I'm Steve Turnowski with General Motors, and I'll be on one of the, mo the mobility panel uh, later this afternoon. But since you showed a slide early on, a vision of a smart microgrid building of the future, 
I saw bikes, which is good, but there was no EVs, there was no EV charging. Why, why is that? Don't you see that as part of the future? I, I think uh, my, my talents in, in graphics, but you're right, EV is, uh, that's why GM, uh, Mary Barra, your leader, has uh, made a, and your company has made a huge bet uh, to create probably the most, I don't know if it's the most, but uh, how many models are coming out. But the world is changing dramatically, and so EV, and, and we talked about some of the early panels, how that's going to shift uh, everything from uh, when these cars are being charged, you know, so the transformers, we used to have our load in the afternoon, it might be the evening now, so how are those transformers, they're going to be going around the clock, right, and many of the existing transformers might not take that type of use. So there's all kinds of little issues that you have. The good news is uh, we're moving away from the petrol world. In fact, uh, someone said that last year was the peak, peak for petrol use, and we're going down. And if you see what's happening in China and India, who are, want to be world leaders in this, it's really quite incredible to see the, the mass movement. I was at a smart cities conference in China, uh, Yinchuan, which is the prototype city. Imagine the city that is a million people. That's your lab in China, northern city in uh, near Mongolia, in one of the provinces. They test everything, and then they roll it out to, right now I think they have 400 cities that are on, on pace to become smart cities. So it's quite incredible to see what they're doing in China and in India, but certainly that is a key part of what we're gonna see. Uh, other questions? Anyone? Got a, you got a great group of experts here, or are you just all hungry? <laughs> if not, I, I was going to say real quick, we will be happy to have EVs on the research property over here. <laughs> GM feed. GM. <laughs> Not Ford. Sorry, yes. Lisa, go ahead. So how are you working with, whether it's city planners as they plan out um, new buildings and, you know, again, are there incentives that you're encouraging governments to have to make sure that these communities or cities or corporate campuses are as smart as they can possibly be. Does anyone want to tackle that before I do? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, we, we have worked with uh, several cities over the past uh, many years uh, on variations of this. So since we are focused mo mostly on the electricity and the microgrid side, bringing in renewables, it has to tie into the smart city vision that's actually out there. And uh, the difficult, we worked in Denmark with a city called uh, Kalumberg. So there's a smart city, Kalumberg, and we were working with them for two or three years, developing their infrastructure. Here, uh, where we are based in Fort Collins, there's a Fort Collins Zero Energy District vision, and so we've actually been part of that. And uh, the challenge that I don't think people have quite overcome yet is that uh, when you look at the multi-stakeholder situation, uh, it really, if I simplify it, I'll say, it comes down to a situation where you want to connect service providers to service subscribers, or whatever the service might be. Is it the city? Is it private parties that are actually coming in? Just answering that question, uh, I think, uh, has been the, you know, the tar pit that we've been stuck in uh, with these projects, because it's very interesting to talk about the technology and the information and what you can open up and all the grand things you can enable, mm -hmm. but ultimately it comes down to saying, who transact that, transacts that business with who, and who makes the investment? I think there's tremendous potential there, but uh, having sort of standardized models to actually scale that really hasn't happened. And it's probably more, you know, regulatory and contracts oriented. You probably need innovations in contracting before the other things can actually happen. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd add one more thing. I, th I think from the standpoint of, uh, of what we're trying to do with intelligent buildings, the, the uh, code requirements for lighting control is a huge driver. And we've seen, we see, really saw that start in California and, mm -hmm. and we have massive saturation there now. And that's where most of the, early advances are coming out in terms of leveraging that sensor data for other things. But we're seeing that roll across the country. And so, you know, I, that that march of progress, I have a lot of confidence in. The advantage, though, I, I don't think we can do it purely based on regulatory drivers. And so we have to think about market drivers as well. And so, you know, the idea of the cost savings from, from energy savings and then leveraging that to be able to produce something that has an even higher value to the organizations that are, that, that are uh, sitting inside those buildings. In the end, that's what's going to win out. Um, so, we, you know, it was great to have the, the code for, for getting us started, but, you know, we, I think we all have to be thinking about real market drivers uh, to create a pull, not just a push. And one of the things I would add to it is that uh, there are certain drivers, industry leaders, uh, JLL, CBRE, 
uh, Liberty Property Trust, Cadillac Fairview, which is on our board. They really get it. They're doing things like the shopping malls, the commercial. So there's a lot of great activities, and you work with many of them. So the sad part is they're, the old paradigm, the existing infrastructure, the 6.4 million commercial buildings we have in Canada, United States, are existing with existing uh, technology that's very difficult or for some people to perceive. It's not impossible, but it's the, the perception is, let's just do it the way we've done it, standalone systems, lighting is connected to nothing except lighting, and then we, how do we make that change? Well, we, we don't, you know, we just go on the old, even the new buildings, we just bid low bid, low price, lowest cost, oh, I'm gonna flip the building anyway, let the next guy deal with it. So there's a lot of uh, things that we have to overcome through education. We're planning to do uh, uh, intelligent building summit with Agora. We have my two colleagues from Agora over there, and we want to bring together 110 builders, developers, facility managers to to meet with with the top people that are, that are se uh, selling this intelligent building technology. That's one way we can help educate smart cities. I know Andreas, you work with many of uh, many different uh, groups with smart cities. Research shows there's a thousand cities, over a thousand cities that have plans, actually legitimate plans for smart cities. Guess where they are? 400 in China, 100 in India, the, the rest the rest of the world. So we don't have many when you think of all the great cities out there. And there's some great ones. Austin would be one of the leaders. Uh, Palo Alto, I mean, there's some, Barcelona, there's some great smart cities with some amazing plans. And we, I speak at, at these events and I, I, when I get invited, I say, if you have a smart city, yes, you can have smart street lights, you can have smart, uh, um, uh, traffic lights, but if you don't have your fire station, police station, public works buildings, city hall, if you don't have your munis, which in some case telcos, if you're not part of uh, smart buildings within your own city, I don't know how you can call yourself a smart city. So we approach it from that angle, and some of the cities are really doing, there's a lot of money. When the mayor gets on side, city council gets on side, then things will happen, and there's a lot of money. It's a tremendous amount of money. So. Uh, and companies like Cisco, those are gentlemen from Cisco. I mean, there, there's some great companies in here that are doing some, a lot of activity with those smart cities. Uh, other questions? We're getting close to the end here. What, let's, let's have a closing round then. Uh, what, what, if, you, what, if you could tell this group, here's, here's where we, what we need to do when it comes to intelligent buildings and even microgrids. What would you say? Well, here's the, if they could just do one thing, one, what would it one, be? One okay. Yeah, um, what, I'll say two things. Um, drop the serial canvas completely and go IP. And number two is have semantic data model like Haystack right at the edge with the computation power. Fantastic. All right. Jim. Call Edison Energy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then use, look, don't use the past way of deciding whether you're gonna invest in this because it's gonna take different thinking. You can't use simple payback on this. It has to be a different perspective. Okay, next, Greg. Yeah, I'd say uh, I'd, I'd build on that because I think uh, it's, it's bringing together multiple stakeholders before you get a project going. So, you know, not doing it the old way of saying, well, we're gonna bid out mechanical to mechanical, we're gonna bid out, bid out electrical to electrical, those streams should never cross. Uh, we're not going to bring IT or any of the business functions in until the building's already built. I think it really requires us to start taking a much more proactive and collaborative uh, approach to this to be able to, to understand how all of this infrastructure is going to play together to drive benefits for everybody uh, if it's specified correctly. Good point. I would say uh, think about microgrids as an enabler for services delivery, uh, wherever they might be within the energy ecosystem. Uh, so it's not a thing, it's not a technology thing that you use for something, but it's an enabler for various types of services. And I would say take advantage of our living laboratory uh, research facility to evaluate, um, develop, and demonstrate your technologies to clients and, and whoever might be interested in, in the kind of work that you're doing. I'm going to leave you one closing thought. I saw this uh, just recently on a, on a news bulletin and it said, you know, we're moving uh, to the Internet of Things, of course, and ev literally everything will be connected, inanimate objects, because sensors can be printed now. They are photovoltaic, so they can get enough power off, off your indoor lighting. So there's a lot of things that are changing and coming very dramatically. 
Sensors are very cheap today. There'd be, there'd be so many of them. So the term I, I just saw, it's, it's I and then number four, T, Internet for Things. And that's a term that you're going to see more and more. And that's where the world's moving. So we will maybe eventually solve that interoperability issues. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause for this great panel. Stay put.